shakes the whole earth in holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Here we go. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. You would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Let's celebrate him this morning for everything that he's done, everything he's going to do. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. Thank you, Jesus. That I would be set you've done for me he's so worthy church he's so worthy right now I just want you in your mind just think about just this week what the Lord has done for you I want to celebrate Elizabeth is here safe and sound this morning she got in a little car accident last night but the Lord's hand was upon her her car is total but she's just bumped up and bruised a little thank you Jesus for your mercy Thank you, Jesus. Let's give him praise, church. Let's just declare his worthiness. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Here we go. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain And worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy Oh, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross oh, You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Give him praise, church. Give him praise. Out of the wilderness into your deliverance, look where I'm standing now. These hands that once were chained 
now lifted high in praise look where i'm standing now look where i'm standing now i stand on the chain break miracle make powerful name of jesus on the body raised prodigal saved powerful name of Jesus led by your mighty hand into the promised land look where I'm standing now you carried the cross for me now i'm a child of the king look where i'm standing now look where i'm standing now i stand on the chain break miracle make powerful name of jesus on the Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescue Hallelujah, I stand on the chain break, miracle make, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. I stand on the chain. On the body raised, prodigal sing, powerful name of Jesus. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. You know that God is a God of His promise. His yes is yes and amen. And most of you who are family in this church know that we've been walking through a journey with my daughter who was diagnosed with um, high-risk leukemia four years ago and um, her prognosis was not great, but God, and literally carried her through. And um, they had told us that she had to medically make it to five years to be considered a survivor in the medical community. But we got the news when we went to see her oncologist on Friday, he said, you know, I am just so amazed. Her labs just look phenomenal. They just continue to look better and better and just amazing. He said, in fact, so amazing that I wanna see her one more time in February. And then after that, we're gonna declare her a survivor and move her to survivorship. <laughs> Won't he do it? Won't he do it? So Jesus, we just thank you that you are the chain breaking, you are the miracle making, you are the way maker, you are the one who will do it. 
Because nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop you. Your plans will be accomplished. Thank you that we can rest in that. We bless you, Jesus. We honor you. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, well, I've never been more glad. Cause I put my faith in Jesus. Cause He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. No, he won't. I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus And He's never let me down He's faithful through every season So why would He fail now? He won't He won't, no, no, he won't fail, he won't fail, oh, he won't, sing that again, oh, he won't, no, 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 oh, he won't fail, he won't Christ is my firm foundation. Woo! He's the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. Well, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause He's never let me down. He's faithful. So why would he fail now? He won't. No, he won't. No, no, no. He won't fail. He won't fail. You know, songs like this, we sing them. And we say that I've never been more glad than when <laughs> I'm shaken. Sometimes in the shaking, we're not saying that. But I can tell you on the other side of it, on the other side where you find victory, you can look back and with wholeheartedness say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you knew what was absolutely best for me. You knew what I needed. Because you see, here's the thing. When she got diagnosed, I had to quit my job and walk away from teaching. I'd been teaching music for years, so I had to walk away immediately. They said, pack your bags, you're living in the hospital now. You're not going home. You're gonna live here basically for three years. And I just couldn't understand why God would allow this. But see, something happened during that time when she was going through that battle. I started digging really deep, started digging really deep into nutrition, and I started really digging deep into holistic care, and I decided to go back to school and I decided to, to finish my certificate in nutrition. And now here I stand today, and in one week I'm opening up my own medical clinic. Listen, the Lord would have never allowed that. That would have never come into my life had he not brought me through what I needed to go through to bring me to this place where I'm gonna be able to open up a place where people can walk through and find wholeness and healing and find Jesus for the whole person. You see, he had a plan in all of it. And here's the thing, 
he's not finished. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning of what he has. This is just the beginning of the whys, all those whys that I asked. So listen, if you're in a season right now where the rain has come and the wind is blowing and you don't understand and you're asking why, here's the thing that you can trust. He will never fail you. He will never fail you. And there is purpose in that pain and it carries eternal weight. And so God, this morning, we rest in your goodness in every season of rain and wind and storm that comes. God, we know that you are the calm and that you stand there on the waves and you say, be still. When it's time to be still, you just say with a command, be still. So Father, in the middle of that storm, we keep our eyes on you, fixed on you, fixed on you. Sea rains came and went, blue, but my house was built on you. And I'm safe with you, I'm gonna make it through. Sing it again, church. Rains came, went, blue, but my house was built on you. And I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through one more time let's sing a church rains came winds blue but my house was built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through Cause my house is built on you Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking well, I've never been more glad Cause I put my faith He's never let me down. He's faithful through generation. So I would give him out. He will. No, he will. He won't fail. again. He won't fail. No, he won't fail. You never fail, Jesus. You never fail, Jesus. Thank you that you meet us, God. We're asking right now for your presence to just sweep through this room. Sweep through this room. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Sweeping in. comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory of the Lord, sweeping in a room. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Sweeping in the room. Here 
Here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Sweeping in the room. Cause heaven is on the moon. Jesus is on the throne. And though all the nations rage, well, I know God is in control. Kingdom is coming now. He's changing the atmosphere, rolling in like a cloud. The King of Glory is here. Here comes the glory of the Lord. the glory of the Lord sweeping in the room here comes the glory here comes the glory of the Lord here comes the glory of the in your presence this morning. Holy Spirit, you are more than welcome. Come and do what only you can do. You see, there's, there's songs that touch our emotion, move us physically, and then there's worship. And what it does is it allows your spirit, man, to commune with the Father. It allows the Father to speak to your spirit. It's deeper. It does something more. It's why sometimes when you're sitting in worship and you just start crying, it, it goes beyond just singing songs. There's more to worship than just saying words. It's encountering the presence of the living God. 
Jesus, this morning, we've encountered you. Sweeping in the room. Ayla, would you sing that? Here comes the glory of the Lord. Here comes the glory of the Lord. Sweeping in the room. There's no one like you. Thank you that when we come to meet with you, what we find is here you are just waiting to encounter us. You long to be with us, the God who created the heavens and the earth, who breathed out stars, who took dust and breathed life into it. You long to meet with us. Thank you for that love, that unfathomable love. And and thank you for this thing that we call church. Really, you just call it your children. Meeting together in a room to all agree that you are worthy of praise. You are worthy, Jesus. We honor you, we love you, and all the church said, amen. amen. Actually, pastor's appreciation, but we've been in routes of doing things here, of putting things together. And so we'd like to ask our pastors, Pastor Jerry and Angie Edmond, to come up at this time. Yes. We just want to say thank you for your sacrifice of love of all the time and talents and gifting and the things that you do, whether it's counseling, preaching, pulling together, you know, your sermons and learning and, you know, and we just want to say thank you. And this year we're doing something a little bit different. And we are sending you away because you're always giving of your time. <laughs> so we're sending you on just a small trip of a, a cruise this year. And we want to tell you how much we love you. And it's on behalf of the pastoral team and this great congregation. Couldn't do it without them. Yay, let's. So we just, we love you from all of us at FWC. Thank you very much. Where are we going? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's um, it's always such a privilege to uh, to get to serve. I. Uh, I told Angie, I said, I'm always uncomfortable uh, receiving like that. That just, it's just uncomfortable. But uh, I do want to say thank you. Thank you. It's, it's showing appreciation for one another is something that, that uh, should be a part of our life and it should be part of a healthy relationship. Uh, you always, you, you know, if they say if you, use your, if you use your friends less, they'll last longer. Quite frankly, having friends that give and that sow and that help uh, is so meaningful to us. And there's a lot of things that we're building here. God's really blessed us with a wonderful family, a wonderful team. At least you come here just a minute, would you? Just, I want you to just come up here. I just want to say how much I love this girl right here. Ryan, why don't you come up here also? Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll let you. Perfect. Uh, good morning. I'm going to back up here for a minute. And 
use the podium. Um, you know that, that knot you get in your stomach when you're about to go in front of everybody and speak. It's, it's there. Will you marry me? No. Um, all right. Well, good morning. Um, you know, thank you for, for allowing me to be up here. This is something that we've worked on for a couple weeks now, and I've, I've gone back and forth, changed this probably a thousand times. Um, so I got it because otherwise I'll just ramble. So I'm going to try to stay. It may be rigid, but just follow me, please. Um, I wanted to uh, just take a few minutes to, to speak about a very special day for me, um, November 21st, 1998, a day that changed my life forever. Uh, 25 years ago, Alicia and I stood at an altar in front of family and friends and, and made a promise to each other. We promised that moving forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, that we would love and cherish each other until death parted. 25 years later, we still stand together, and we are stronger than we ever thought possible. From the very beginning, we decided that divorce wasn't an option. In fact, it wasn't even in our vocabulary. With that mindset, we pushed through every big problem, knowing that we had to find a, find a solution because divorce wasn't an option. We promised each other that when we reached that point, you know, the, the point where divorce was an option, um, we would drop everything and just completely change direction. We had been told from day one from people we thought we knew and trusted that our marriage wouldn't last. People placed bets against us. People wanted us to fail. But here we are, and we've outlasted 99% of those people. These past few weeks, our relationship has been under attack by spurts of rain jealousy that seemed to manifest out of nowhere, a jealousy that, that should have no stronghold in our lives, but it happened. You know, we, we've both been guilty of being a little crazy and a little short with each other. So even after these crazy weeks, I'm still madly in love with you and nothing will change that. So I thought I would do something extremely uncomfortable and come on stage in front of family and friends and, and tell you that these past 25 years have been great, but Um, something that's meant a lot to me uh, early in our marriage. Um, I remember we went to a marriage conference. And, you know, if, if you've been to one at some point, the, the speaker asked people to stand up, married couples. And they start off, you know, if you've been married five years or less, sit down, 10 years or less, sit down, until it eventually gets to one couple, one couple that's still standing. When I saw that, I got into my mind that that's what I want to be. I want to be that one couple that's still standing at the end of the day. So there, there is peace in my soul knowing that through our many trials and without a doubt, I know without a doubt that you were made for me. You are my precious gift and I will take care of you. I will honor you. I will love you till the end of time. Happy early anniversary. Thank you. What you don't know, that's totally uncharacteristic for him. He is a behind-the-scenes guy. You know, all the out front that I am, he's that much behind the scenes. And what he didn't tell you is that we got married when I was 17, and he was 19 years old. We had a little 18-month-old already because we got pregnant in high school. The odds were stacked against us. And uh, truly, there were people at our wedding placing bets that we wouldn't make it. And uh, most of the time, that doesn't happen. But the difference about us is that um, early on in our marriage, God came in and, and wrecked everything, which was good. It needed to happen. And, and since then, we've been surrounded with the family of God. And um, 
my parents who've loved and supported us. And the only reason we're still standing together 25 years later is because we've always been a part of a family who's loved us and encouraged us. So you see those young little married couples, man, just get them into church. <laughs> get them into church so that they'll be surrounded with encouragement and, uh, and they'll make it. One of these days, I'm going to get a new microphone, and everybody's going to be so jealous. <laughs> you know, the fact is, is this is a family, and um, that exemplifies that so strongly. Uh, we, we celebrate your families uh, much more than you know. We pray for you. Uh, good things are happening. I'll tell you something. Our heart, our desire is, is to build strong families has been that since the beginning, building strong families for the 21st century. And that's something that we've wanted to do and, and the buildings we put up, the outreaches that we had, the classes, the sermons, the fellowships, everything has to do with building strong families. This being Thanksgiving week, I think we need to really uh, reiterate our our commitment to one another with thankfulness, thanksgiving. I think that's very important. It's so easy. Isn't that amazing? That's the easiest gift to give, and yet people sometimes have the most difficulty giving it. You know, I, I, want, to, I want to this morning, before we move forward, I want to uh, uh, receive our tithing, our offering. Um, I want to say we also add something in here in regard to our building fund. Um, we are building some things here. Now, I know that sometimes here you see movement, and it's like watching hair grow. It's very slow. Uh, but that's by design. I've been in places that we're going to build, you know, a, a kingdom in 30 days, and it just doesn't, life doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You build and you stand together, and finally the next generation comes and stands on your shoulders. What we're doing is, is we're building for the next generation also, not just for this generation, but for the next. I remember when we were across the street, we had a desire to grow. We really didn't have the capacity because we were on a very small piece of land over there. And uh, Mark Stewart bought this property we're on, this 10 acres that we're on. And uh, over a period of time, he was going to build a house here. But over a period of time, he just said, I just feel like I'm not supposed to. He said, I just feel like I would like to give that to the church. Now, here's the thing that he did that he really couldn't see at that time. And most of the time, we can't see it at that time. There was no way possible that at that time when we were standing across the street looking at a vacant piece of land that maybe didn't have that much value at that time. That was a long time ago by comparison to what it is today. But there was no way that he could see this building right here with you inside of this. There was no way possible that he could see all these children lining up here and going to children's church, nor the children's facility, nor this extra educational building we have back here, and the things that's coming up. And the things that you give, I want you to think generationally. When you give, don't just make it something that this is not, a, this is not just a tax break for you. But what this is, is you're sowing into the future. There was no way Mark could have ever understood what was in front and what's coming because the time's going to come, should the Lord tarry, that we're going to pass the baton to the next generation. And, and when we're gone, a people that we haven't even met yet are going to be blessed because of what one man's obedience did. So this morning, I'm asking you to give generationally. I want you to think about the future. This is something you can sow in that's not going to run its, its uh, it's not going to lose its uh, warranty in 30 days or 90 days or 
five years. This is going to be something that when we're gone, our children's children will be using. And this is something we've committed ourselves as much as possible. We're staying out of debt. We've stayed out of debt this whole time. Are you saying you'd never go in debt? No, I'm not going to ever say that. But I'm just saying we've made that decision. We don't want to. And God has blessed us. And as a result, like I said, it moves awfully slow. But you know what? The generosity of this house has been such that we haven't needed that. We just said we'll just wait and see what happens. And God provides. And so this morning as you give, I want you to, I want you to think for just a few moments generationally. I want you to think about the children that pass through here, that it won't be long till those little children that pass through here will be the parents that bring their children through here. And those kids that come through here will be the ones that will be leading the worship and will be preaching the messages and will be doing the ushering, will be caring for the property. And they'll be raising their children up in this place. Think generationally. Think bigger picture. You've got to think that way. And then what you do is, is you sow toward that. That was a big step for Mark to do that because he didn't know what he was going to do. He said, I just need God to provide me a house. But he acted, and the fruit of what he's done is going to be eternal. How many souls will be saved in this? How many lives will be changed? How many marriages will be put back together? Mark gets a piece of that pie. That's the truth. And so what you do isn't just for the day, it's generational. And so I want you this morning, I just want you to close your eyes with me, and whether it be your tithing, your offering, maybe you want to give something toward the building fund. We're going to be, because the, the time, listen, the time is going to come, what we're going to do, David Glass, he came and talked to us the other day, he said, you got 1,500 homes going to be built right two blocks away from here. You know, something's about to happen. Things are going to begin to change. I'm thinking, I don't want to go build another building right now. So what I'm thinking, I'm going to tear out that entire back wall back to the very front, and we'll build another foyer all the way out there into the parking lot. We also want to get a drive through We're going to be expanding. We're going to be enlarging, doubling our seating capacity. And it's going to be good. But the time will come when maybe that won't even be enough. Maybe we also need to build a gymnasium. Maybe we need to build some kind of a health center in this place that people can come. I always desired, you know, I remember when I was standing on the slab of our educational building back here. We didn't even have the building up yet. And I looked over and I saw the house over there. We didn't own that property over there yet. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I sure would like to have that piece of property. You know, of course, when you start talking like that, God partners with you and he goes and makes that happen. Isn't that amazing? But I looked at that little house and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be incredible to have a place where people could come just for light, medical stuff, eyes, just health, just someone to look at them, take their temperature, help them in some capacity. I always thought that would be so great maybe to find doctors or nurses that could volunteer a day of their time or a couple of hours a month just to come in and just, just sit with people and help them that maybe couldn't help get help any other way. I just, I would love to have that. I would love to have a school here. I'm planning on starting a new class or in Cygnus. We had that a couple of years ago, and we're going to begin. It's going to, be a, it's going to start this next year. It's going to be good. We'll be doing it once a month. It won't be overbearing. But we've got a lot of things coming up. And, you know, quite frankly, if you just say, hello, somebody's going to charge you something. So it cost us to do it. It cost us. And so as you're giving this morning, would you just think generationally with me? Just, just think generationally. What's coming up is going to be a whole bunch. I told Lucy and Bill the other day, I said, you know, the time would come, I would love for us to give a million dollars to missions. I'm thinking generationally. I'm thinking, I'm thinking bigger than our little, I'm thinking we're going to do something. We're going to do something. I'm just telling you, we're going to do something. And you, and I don't say me, we are going to do something. And great is going to be our reward in heaven because of what we've done. So this morning, would you believe with me? Would you, listen, would you dare to dream with me just a little bit? Would you get daring enough that you're thinking, whew, okay, all right, all right, we'll go. You know, you know that feeling when you're thinking, I know that's out there. Let's, let's just, 
let's do something for fun. I, 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 I just want to do something. I just want to do something for God. You know, I know he doesn't need us to do a bunch of stuff, but I want to do it anyway. I, I just want to do it. I'm just going to, and I'm going to tell the Lord about it, and he'll say, all right, get after it. But would you dream with me? Would you, would you dare to just, I remember back a few years ago when Angie was wanting to do some backpacks for the community. And we started with, I don't know, 50 or 100, and then we were building up toward 500 that we were giving away. I'm full backpacks for the kids going to school. We can do some things from here. We can make a difference. We can, we can do that. And so I'm just going to ask you just to bow your head with me and we just think generationally with me for just one moment and just, just tell the Lord, say thank you for how you bless me. And I want to just be a blessing. The blessing of Abraham wasn't you're just going to get a blessing, it's you're going to be a blessing. So, Father, I want to thank you, Father, for the, I want to thank you for what Mark did. He could not know, he could not conceive in his mind what was going to happen after all of these years. But here we are, standing on this stage talking about what God did and how he provided. Thank you, Father, for using him and using all of the other people that have so graciously sown into the kingdom of God. I was asking God that you'd bless this, this tithing, this offering, and uh, speak to every heart in accordance with what you have planned for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Electronic giving in the back. Those of you that want to come up to the front, if you would please come. You can also, on your phone app, you can use that. But let's all stand and let's just come and let's just bless the Lord with our giving this morning. Father, we thank you today for blessing us as you have. You've been so good to us. I want to speak a pastoral blessing over this tithing, this offering, over the vision that's been given here today, the vision. Thank you, Lord, for the vision that you put in our hearts. Thank you for the ability to pull it together. Lord, we bless this. I declare the blessing and the favor coming out, going in. Bless all they put their hands to, I pray. Prosper their businesses, their families, their relationships. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You know, the Lord has been dealing with me about something I'm going to write on. I was thinking of the term mercy. Mercy. We as Christians, we use that phrase a lot, don't we? But you know, I think that's misused. I don't think mercy has much to do with us anymore. It was important at one time, and God gave it. He gave it to us at the cross. His mercy was poured out for you and I. But I don't really like the term mercy when it comes to us anymore. Mercy is a courtroom term. It's something you go before the judge, and you're not really sure what he's going to do. You don't know if he's going to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and you really just kind of have the mindset of, just have mercy. I'm, I'm at a point where I don't deserve what I'm asking for, but if you'll just give some mercy toward me. And although that did apply to us at one time, his love was poured out at the cross. And that's not the rule by which we live anymore. We don't live by mercy. I think kindness is more the word now that fits our relationship with him. 
generosity, it's gentleness, it's love. That's how he deals with us. Mercy, he already gave it. <laughs> but now I live in a state of beauty and of kindness. I know how he's going to respond to me. He already did. He responded at the cross. His love was poured out at the cross. His mercy was given at the cross. So I don't really use that term anymore. Have mercy. I don't live that. You know what, you know what the Bible says? He makes a table before us in the presence of our enemies. That's the relationship we have. That's the way we walk. I'm walking in his kindness and his goodness. I want you all to stand with me this morning. Maybe you've been in a situation where you just feel like somehow I feel unworthy. I feel like I feel like maybe I've messed up. Maybe I've not been this, or maybe I should have prayed more. Maybe I should have. I mean, we've got the whole gamut of things that we can talk about that we need to do. But you don't come to God not sure what he's going to do. <laughs> you don't come to him wondering how he's going to respond to you. You know why? Because he loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you. <laughs> he's already embraced you. I told someone the other day, I said, when you told God about your problem, that wasn't when he found out about it. <laughs> he, he knew about it all along, and he loved you every moment. It's his kindness that's been extended to us. It's his kindness. So I just want you right now, just close your eyes and say, thank you, Lord, for your kindness to me. I've been given a double portion of his loving kindnesses, his tender, his tender mercies, the beauty of his relationship. I love you, Lord. <laughs> I love you, Lord. <laughs> with all my heart, with all my soul, with all that is within me, <laughs> beyond description. <laughs> you're more wonderful, you're more glorious than my heart can even imagine. How I worship you, O oh Lord. Oh, I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. You know, as Alicia sings, I want you just to lift up your hearts and just love him for a few moments, would you? Lord, I worship you and I thank you for your goodness. Can't go back to the beginning. Can't control what tomorrow will bring. But I know here in the Is the place where you promise to be. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I
singing that I just felt so strongly in my spirit that there's some people here today that you've been messing with some stuff that you shouldn't be messing with and literally this is what I hear the Lord saying not you that's not for you I have more for you and it's not in condemnation you understand correction from him is not coming from a place of condemnation. It's coming from a heart that absolutely loves you and sees what he's created you to be. And if somebody had looked at my life when I was 15 years old and pregnant and said, hey, when you're 42, you're gonna be, have been married for 25 years and leading worship and in this place, I would have never believed them. But you wanna know why? It's because the Lord said, I have more for you. You can stay this prodigal over here wallowing in the mud with the pigs or you can come back home to your father or have so much more an inheritance waiting for you. Listen, the Lord's not asking you to stop messing with sin because he's bringing condemnation to you. He's asking you to stop messing with it because he has an inheritance waiting for you. There's something so much more. So this morning, if you feel like, yeah, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. But is the Lord really gonna meet me here again because I know he sees all and he knows all. Yeah, absolutely. He's meeting with you right now with all the love that you could possibly imagine. He's saying, not you. That's not for you. Come up here. Come up here. Come up here with your father because I have so much more. So this morning, let me tell you, his mercies are new every single day. Right now, if you're needing a fresh wind, a new start, a new dose of mercy, this morning, the Lord's going to sweep through this place. And that is a gift to you every single day. This morning, I'm asking you to accept it. I'm asking you to receive it so you can step into your inheritance. Speak. 
hear it sound, rushing wind, fire of God, fall within, Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. And as we repent, turn from sin, revival embers smoldering, breath of God, fan us into flame. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Hearts that burn with holy fear, purified in faith and deed, refiner's fire, strengthen what remains. So we the church bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright, king and kingdom come is what we pray. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. A holy anointing, the power of your presence. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. for what we can't do, for where we can't go. We can't go without you. We can't do it without you. We can't be it without you. So Lord, right now, touch our hearts. We yield to you. We yield to you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Would you turn to somebody and tell them, say, I sure do love you. Would you just do that? Say, I love you.
the quickest way to eliminate God's favor from your life is unthankfulness. The quickest way to eliminate God's favor from your life is unthankfulness. What springs out of unthankfulness is a murmur, a complaint. If you want to see how that worked out for the children of Israel, go back to the book of Exodus. They had something in their heart, and it was unthankfulness. And really, to complain about your circumstances is a slander against the keeping power of God. Because in all that God did for them during that time, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, dear God, they saw things that probably no one in history had ever seen before, and yet they complained. Now, why would they do that? It was because they were unthankful. Unthankful. Romans chapter 1, it talks about a generation that is just simply lost. And the reference that it gives in regard to that generation, it says, neither were they thankful. So here's what I found, and I want to share this with you this morning. You can't complain and be thankful at the same time. <laughs> okay, I'm so glad that all three of you appreciate that. I want to read this to you. The key to happiness, nothing initiates a person. I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Nothing irritates a person. Boy, that's a whole different game, isn't it? <laughs> nothing irritates a person more than being kind or generous to someone who doesn't appreciate it. That's why we constantly prod our kids to say please and thank you. For the benefit of being thankful goes way beyond being polite. Gratitude is the key to happiness itself. That's so important. Every happy person that you know is a grateful person. And every ungrateful person cannot be happy. Now, this is a cause and effect, something that we need to have. We tend to think that being unhappy is what leads people to complain, but actually complaining is what makes people unhappy. Okay, I want to say that one more time. We tend to think that being happy is what leads people to complain, but actually complaining is what makes them become unhappy. It says in Psalms chapter 92, verse 1, it is good to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing praises to your name. Psalms 107, 8, 9 says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works and the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, he fills the hungry soul with goodness. So, let me finish this up here. Learning to be thankful, whether to God or other people, is the best hedge against taking life for granted. The less we take for granted, the more enjoyment we get out of life. If we never give any thought to the good things that we have done, such as our family, our home, our country, the blessings that we have been, that we have been given through our Heavenly Father, then we will begin to take those things for granted. So thankfulness and gratitude, gratitude is actually a product of humility. The Hebrew word for gratitude is hara ha, which means, and gratitude is prettier than that, but which is the same word that is used for confession. Isn't that interesting? Being thankful is actually to confess dependence or to acknowledge that someone else has the power to benefit you to admit that your life is better because of their efforts. That's really powerful. That's gratitude. So let's be thankful and not take life for granted. Now the scripture that I wanted to give you this morning is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. This is a really good scripture. Every one of you should know this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God for you. 
It's the will of Christ Jesus for you. Someone say, what's the will of God? I just read it to you. Right there. Give thanks in everything. Give thanks. Now, I didn't say for everything. Big difference. There's a lot of things that I'm not thankful for at all. But what I'm saying is that in the midst of everything that happens around me, I never lose that sense of thankfulness, gratitude, and appreciation for who God is, for how he's brought me through this, he's brought me through that. And someone, I heard someone the other day, they said, well, if there's really a God, how can there be so many problems in the world? Because we live in an earth curse system. There's an enemy of God by the name of Lucifer who actually usurped authority from Adam and he became the God of this world. The world fell under a curse and men begin to die. They begin to operate under his nature and as a result, they begin to hate one another and take advantage of one another and use one another and disease broke out and death broke out and hatred broke out. All of that came as a result of fallen man in that cursed state. But God showed up in the middle of it and said, if you make a covenant with me, I'll bless you even though everything around you is dying. I'll hear your prayers. I'll take care of you. I'll watch over you. I'll answer things for you that you don't know. You'll call on me and I will answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't know. So what God wants you to do is in the midst of your situation, regardless of what that might be, he wants you to give thanks. And, and I know it's difficult because sometimes things don't look right. This is going wrong and it's very difficult for me to see how God could work anything out of that. But see, God's plan doesn't necessarily revolve around your comfort or your understanding, which drives me up the wall. I've got things that I would like to share with the Lord that I'd like to say, Lord, this is really the way this thing ought to be. But he never consulted me. Things that are happening around me in spite of me that I don't even know about. So, what happens is sometimes God will have you in a place that you don't understand. He's got you in a place that feels like hardness and difficulty. And he's saying to you, look, I understand you're facing some challenges. I know that. But the fact is, is in the midst of that, don't you lose the heart of gratitude. Don't you lose the thankful heart. Don't you lose that sense of appreciation to be able to say thank you. I appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. And, and because we have to understand, here's the revelation. He's God. And we're not. Now, I know that's very difficult for us to swallow, but the fact is, is we trust in him to do what we don't understand. I, I, <laughs> we, we don't know what's going on. We're not sure what's happening around us. I, we don't even know what we're going to have for lunch tomorrow. We, we kind of think we know what's going to happen today, but we're not even completely sure about that. I just wander over the place and say, is there any cake? I mean, that's just, that's, that's just my, <laughs> that's my job right there. I remember some time ago, I, was, I, was, uh, I went to Scotland. We were in, we were in London, and, and uh, we, we caught a plane, and we went up to Scotland, and I went to play golf at St. Andrews, the old course. Can we pause just for a moment, for a moment of homage for that? It was wonderful. Well, anyway, sorry I got caught up on the third hole there. <laughs> we finished that up driving around. We went back over to Glasgow. We were going to catch our plane to go back to London, and we missed our plane. We were a couple of minutes late. We just couldn't get there in time. They wouldn't let us on, so we just had to rent a car and drive all the way from Glasgow to London. Well, let me just tell you something. I've never been there before. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of amazing thing. Uh, you're driving on the wrong side of the car. You're driving on the wrong side of the road. You know, your, their, their road system there is completely different from ours. We have to understand that. That was the first time I ever heard about a roundabout. I'd never even heard of that before. And the GPS came on, and it made this statement. You know, it says, now, at the next roundabout, I want you to take the third exit. And I thought... What, what, what's a roundabout? I don't even know what that is. But sure enough, you know, you just go in this little circle and spin around. On the third one, you spit out this direction or that direction. It's wonderful. 
But the GPS began to give us some instructions about how we were going to get from Glasgow to London, which was a long way. And, and there was a couple of things that I, I wanted to share with you about that because it was dark. We did not know what was going on. We didn't know where we were. We had never been on that road before. It just seemed completely wrong. And we literally had to take it step by step. The, that was my first time of ever actually using uh, 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 GPS, well as GPS though, you know, and, and had this, this, is a, this lady, she has this beautiful British accent, you know, and, and you know, I just fell in love. As a matter of fact, my phone today still has that beautiful British accent on it, that lady telling me what to do. But we started out on this trip and I had a sense that we were going the wrong direction. I thought this isn't right. Um, somehow, it, my, my sense of direction, I felt like London was that way, and it was taking us another way. So it just felt wrong, but the machine kept saying it was the way to go. That's like life a lot of times, isn't it? Sometimes we feel like it's supposed to go that way, but we're being directed this way. And then, to top that off, it would give us a little bit of instruction, and then it would have long periods of silence and not tell us anything. And that was tormenting to me, because I'm thinking, where are we? I, I know this isn't right. And I wrote this down. I wanted to share this with you. Sometimes we, we have to hold to the last word we receive from the Lord, even though at times it feels wrong, and there are times when he's not saying anything anything at times when you go through seasons of silence and uncertainty you've got to hold to the last word that you receive from the Lord and continue to go that way and not get discouraged not stop not turn around had I turned around and gone some other direction there's no I would probably still be driving around that place trying to find a way out but what we couldn't see was is it deterred us deterred us another direction because there was we had to go this they were having some blockage here and we had to go around this river to, and, and so just a few miles of back roads we hit an interstate highway that took us all the way to London and I thought what a great lesson in life because we tend to resist what we don't understand something happens that feels uncomfortable something happens that just seems like it shouldn't be that way and we find ourselves backing up stopping well I'll, I'll, I'll do something else I'll, I'll, well, what was the last thing God told you to do now, number one what's tragic is when people get in a bad spot and they don't ask the Lord what he wants to do but when God gives you a word your next thing is to stop and say what was the last thing that God spoke to me See, we couldn't see the blockage. We couldn't see what was going on. It reminds me of the story of Joseph. I think I'm going to go into a series the last part of this year on Joseph. I'm so fascinated with him. Joseph had a dream that this and this was going to happen. And God was going to use him to bring Israel out from being a small tribe to being a nation and take them into the promised land. But see, Joseph had no idea what that would look like. I mean, he's up and he's telling, this is where God, God says he's going to cause the, these people to bow down to me, my father, my brothers, all of these things that just infuriated his brothers. But, but he held to his dream. And the first thing that happened was is they threw him in a hole and sold him to a bunch of Ishmaelites. Now, you talk about things feeling like it ain't going the right direction. That's not what the dream was. The dream was is I was, going to, I was going to rule. I was going to reign. I was going to have this and that. And suddenly somebody got jealous of me and they threw me in a hole. They betrayed me. They lied about me. They betrayed me. See, what in the world? How do I handle this? How do I handle this? He couldn't have any idea. He was taken to Egypt. He was put up there. He was sold as a slave there as a servant to a man by the name of Potiphar who was a captain of the guard. And so, but, but see what we don't understand and this was the amazing thing, sometimes even the challenges and the things that don't look right, everything that happened to him moved him closer to his destination. Because he couldn't, he, he had this dream. Well, he wasn't gonna get it out in the middle of the wilderness. So what happened was God sent a, 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 a cab for him. He, was, he sent his Uber. 
It was a camel. They loaded him in there and they took him where? To Egypt. Moved him toward his destination. That didn't feel right. I've been betrayed. My feelings are hurt. But all the time, God's moving him forward. He sold into Potiphar's house. Things are looking better because now at least I'm working in this situation where I've, I've, it's clean, I have something to eat, God's prospering me, I'm, I'm, and all of a sudden there becomes something that happens between him and Potiphar's wife, and, and boom, she lied about him. She literally lied about him, betrayed him, had him thrown into prison. That ain't looking good at all. This is not what my dream was. But see, at the, in the prison, that was the place of divine appointment between Pharaoh's house and him. He would have never had the opportunity to be drawn into Pharaoh's house had he not gone into that place of divine appointment, the prison. And then he goes in there, what's he doing? He's not pouting. You know, a lot of times we get in our disappointment, the first thing that we do is we pout. Well, I'm bad. Well, things aren't right. Well, I don't feel good. Somebody said something to me. They didn't say something to me. Well, they should have said something to me. You know, I mean, on and on I'm thinking, have we lost our mind? But Joseph wasn't like that. You know what he was doing? He was ministering. He was interpreting dreams. Here is a guy, and he is a prisoner, and he comes up to these two people that came out of Pharaoh, the butler and the baker, and they're all sad, and he says to them, hey, why the long face? I mean, think about this. If anybody had a long face, it probably would have been Joseph. But he wasn't doing that. I can see Joseph walking down the whatever it was, whistling or singing or whatever. And he sees these guys and he can tell something's wrong. And he says to them, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you so sad? And so he starts interpreting their dreams, interpreting their dreams. And finally, you know, he, he realizes, dear God, you know, these guys have connections. They can get me out of this mess. They can get me out of here. And he tells them, he says, this is what happened to me. This is how I was betrayed. This is how, this is how I brought into this place. I'm not supposed to be here. But see, all of a sudden, he's thinking, this is going to be great. He said, when you get out of here, remember me. And as soon as they walked to the door, God said, forget. And for three years, they didn't do anything. Until one day, Pharaoh had a dream. And the guy said, hey, I forgot because he couldn't find anybody that could interpret. There was this guy that interpreted these dreams and it happened just exactly like he said. And boom, he said, fetch him. They brought him in, gave him a shave and a haircut and they brought him in before Pharaoh and all of a sudden now he's in a position that he otherwise could have never ever achieved had he not been brought the path that he was. But see, we don't understand. We don't, it's like I said last week, we don't, we've got one piece of the puzzle, but God has the lid to the box. The things that we're going through that we gripe so <laughs> freely about. I mean, uh, uh, almost unashamed. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just, well, I ain't gonna tell you what I'm thinking, but I'm just, we, we gripe. We, we, so things get hard. Well, things shouldn't get hard. We're, can you show that to me in the Bible? Would you share that scripture with me that you'll never face any hardships? Matter of fact, Jesus said, dude, they're going to throw you in prison. They're going to hate you for my sake. I mean, things are going to happen because you live in an earth curse system. But he's saying in the midst of that, the strength of your life is going to rise up. And he's saying in everything that you encounter, give thanks to the Lord. Don't, don't lose that sense of gratitude. Well, this happened. Yeah, but what good thing happened? Did, did anything, can, can we point to literally anything? Can you get your calendar out and show me anything that has happened that is remotely good? That's what we should give thanks about. Because the Bible said, is there any virtue? Is there any praise? Is, is there anything? He said, meditate on those things. Give thanks for those things. Because an ungrateful heart is a sign that we don't trust that God's going to keep his word concerning us. So we murmur and we complain. And you know what it does? It grieves the heart of God to be unthankful in your present situation. And again, I'm not saying you're thankful for that. I'm not saying that because it would have been so easy for Joseph to complain. I, I heard a man that was born uh, sick 
and you know he was handed a situation he wasn't counting for this guy had muscular dystrophy and he said this he said don't ask why he said ask what I was so amazed with that I'm here for some reason what is it that I'm supposed to do I didn't expect to be here I didn't want to be here I'm not going to analyze the goodness of God and base it on my circumstance and situation. But rather what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to the Lord. I'm going to say, God, I trust you. Proverbs made this statement. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding because when your understanding gets involved in this, you know what you're going to do? You're going to gripe because you don't know what's on the other side of that curtain. You don't know. And you get the idea. Well, it, well nothing good can ever happen. In my opinion, <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost as though our opinion really carries a lot of weight in that area. <laughs> You're not smart enough to have an opinion. <laughs> we are so arrogant. We, we, we are so <laughs> we are so ignorantly arrogant that we think we know anything. Oh, maybe you don't see the humor in it that I do. I just, <laughs> our trust is in him alone. And am I in a situation that's uncomfortable? Probably. <laughs> you turn right, I'm uncomfortable. I don't like this one little bit. But what's God saying in the midst of this? Is this simply one of the, is this my Uber? Is this my, is this moving me from here to here to be positioned to fulfill the will of God in my life? And there's many times what we can do is abort the opportunity. Remember when Jesus prayed, he was praying up, he's in Jerusalem, he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent to you, how often I would have gathered you like a chicken gathers her little chickens under her wings. But he said, you, you didn't know the time of your visitation. They were so blind. They were so arrogant. They were so full of themselves. Religion does that to you. I, I pray, you know, God's not religion, religious. Religion's the worst thing that ever happened to man. Religion is man's attempt to be like God without him. I don't, I don't even need him. He can go wait in the car. I can handle this. That's why we complain. That's why we show our arrogance by voicing our opinions in such a way. <laughs> I sound like I'm nagging, don't I? <laughs> don't ask why. Are you going through something? Suck it up. Pull yourself together. You're a child of God. You have the strength of God in your life. You have the word of God in your lap. You have the Holy Spirit in your life. You have the gifts of the Spirit operating through you. You have the word of your confession that comes out. There ain't nothing's going to face you that, that you don't have the capability to conquer and to bring down. I promise you. So when you face this, Face it like the champion that you are. And with thankfulness, you approach. See, thankfulness actually should be the conversation. Thankfulness should be the seasoning for all your conversation. Every conversation you have should be seasoned with thankfulness. How can I do that? I do that simply because of the fact that I know God's going to show up, man. He's done it before. He's pulled my fat out of the fire so many times, it's not even funny. He's been there for me. I trust him. I know him. I, I, I know that he's going to be there. I know he's got my back. And so as a result, in the midst of this, praise fills my heart. Praise initiates something. See, when, when, when God's telling you to praise his name, it isn't because he somehow insecure needs you to make him 
feel better. But when you begin to declare who he is in the midst of your situation, it initiates from the world of the Spirit, the angels of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit operating in and through you in a way that nothing else will. When I begin to say it, it releases the power of God. When I begin to praise and declare who the Lord is, what do they say? Don't sit there and tell God how big your mountain is. Tell the mountain how big your God is. Are you facing it? Yeah, you're facing it. I know, and I'm sorry. And listen, what we will do as best we can, I promise, we as a church, we will gather around you. We'll, we'll put antiseptic on you. We've got Band-Aids galore. We've got, we've got wraps and things that you haven't even seen yet. We've got, we've got 12 nurses in this room alone. You can't even get a hangnail without somebody knowing what to do with you. We're going to take care of you in the midst of it. But some of that is your responsibility to not allow yourself to fall into unthankfulness. Well, I'm mad. I know. You know, because what happens when we grumble, it gets to where we stop being thankful. And instead of seeing the beautiful sunset we just say the sun's in my eyes we become so consumed with unthankfulness that we can't show appreciation for the dew on the ground and the cool breeze in your face all we see is hardships and and it just comes out of us like a, we throw up a murmur. God help us. God help us. Complaining becomes a prison. Complaining is resistance to instruction. <laughs> and it takes us somewhere. Again, Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> do you hear that? Do we, do we have that up there? Go back, to the, go back to the previous scripture. Okay, look at this. In all your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Now, what's going to mess that up? What, what would cause that to be messed up? Go to the next one. What does verse 7 say? Don't be wise in your own eyes. You don't know everything. Quit, quit, quit thinking, I know what, you don't know it. You, you don't. So what are you going to do in the midst of what looks wrong? I'm not going to be wise in my own eyes, but I'm going to fear the Lord. And what that means is I'm putting my trust in him and I'm going to depart from evil. What's the evil that he's talking about? The evil is to complain about God's provision. Thankfulness, lack of gratitude. <laughs> because we know he's God above all things. Praise always existed in the midst of the battle. It's a declaration of my trust. Guys, we've got to learn that. And let me just tell you something that doesn't come natural. You've got to cultivate that. Can I just give you a couple of quick scriptures? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You're going to go before God with a request? Present your petition with a heart of thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Psalms 92 and verse 1, it said, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to his name. Psalms 107 verse 8, it says, oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works among the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and he fills the hungry with 
goodness. My goodness, we, we look at a full, a full table. We, we have a full plate, and yet we complain. Psalms 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Look at this. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. He is. I'm telling you, the Lord is good. <laughs> He's good. God is really good. And his mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. I love this. It said that God inhabits the praises of his people, not the complaints. Well, if I just pester him enough with it. Okay. I want to do some. This is something you can teach your kids real quick. Okay. I've got just a couple of things. Example of this. Following list of things that parents can do to help their kids live a thankful life. Okay. Number one. You ready for this? Show by example what thankfulness looks like. Show by example what thankfulness looks like. Okay, that's you. Show by, show by example. Well, express gratitude yourself. Values are caught more than taught in most situations, but they need to see that you have gratitude. Okay? Number two, raise your expectation. Raise it. You know how you do that? You say, as for me and my house, we're going to be grateful. Can, can you say that? As for me and my house, we're going to be grateful. We are. I don't, I don't care what. I don't care come hell or high water. We're going to be grateful. We're going to be thankful. All right, number three. Next thing you can teach your children, everyone make a list of things you're grateful for. I think that would probably be good homework for all of us, wouldn't it? If we just go home and actually, do we have some challenges? Yes, we do. Do we have some things that disappoint us? Yes. Have we been hurt? <laughs> yes. Have, have we been wounded? Absolutely. Are we going through things at our job or whatever the case? Yes. But can you write down a few things that you're thankful for? Is there anything that you can write that you're thankful for? And then see how it changes your kids as they get older. All right, number four. Describe what you have done for the child. Now, what you're doing is, is you're giving him an expression of what to be thankful for. God wrote a book about that, what he's done for us, and it's all good. And your children needs to know there are good things that have been done for you that you can be thankful for. Well, they don't appreciate that. Okay. Number five, establish family traditions. Have family rituals that center on gratitude where children learn to express thanks. How important that that is. Number six, dare to say no. We give our children everything they need, but if we try to give it to them everything that they want, we'll do more harm than we do good. If, if a child gets anything he wants, there's a sense sometimes of not appreciating what he does have. Okay? Number seven, never give in to whining or ungrateful behavior. Turn to somebody and say, he's talking about you. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't say that. My grandchildren are professional whiners. They push our, <laughs> they push our buttons. They know, they know, they know, they know. But what you're gonna have to do is never give in to whining. Of course, that's so difficult when you're a grandparent. It's the truth. When you're parents, you just beat them up and say, "Get out of here!" I'm gonna. 
but grandparents is just, <laughs> it's, yes, dear, whatever you want. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Number eight, involve your child in giving. It gets their eyes off of themselves and onto the needs of others. Yeah, that's an important one. And number nine, do, do. No, they, that says don't, but okay, that's, that's got too many letters in that. It's do. Do, can you change that? Is that possible? Do sweat the small stuff. Okay? Do sweat the, because we expect thanks for the big ticket items, but we many times haven't trained our children to say thank you for the daily things. And sometimes teaching them to be thankful for the little things is more important than teaching them to be thankful for the big things. Okay? Number 10. When embarrassing behavior occurs, don't feel bad. Apologize to anyone who was offended and use it as an opportunity to teach the child to appreciate the kindness they have received. Thanksgiving is a teachable skill. And when a child truly becomes appreciative, they reach the point that they're not the center of the universe anymore. It's healthy for them. So thankfulness is, is probably one of the greatest attributes of a believer's life. I have all the faith in the world. Big deal. Well, you don't believe that? Read 1 Corinthians 13. He said, if I have faith that I can move mountains, I don't have love. He said, you're just a bunch of noise. But you know what is truly expressing the heart of God? Like Joseph. And, and I know that Joseph, and I'll say this and we're going to pray. I know that Joseph didn't complain. I know he didn't complain because when he got to the place where he was now the prime minister over all of Egypt. His brothers were brought before him. They thought he was going to kill them. And he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. In other words, when the enemy has a meeting about what he's going to do, God shows up at that meeting and he turns it to your benefit. And so what you can do is in the midst of that ugly meeting, you can say, I'm so impressed God what are you going to do with this how are you going to turn to this I can't wait to see how you're going to be working in my behalf because I'm going to tell you something God's got an incredible crush on you and he's getting worse you're all he thinks about it's his desire to move you forward do you get moved through some difficulties yes do you like it no no it's uncomfortable but the fact is, sometimes you're moved from one spot to another because you have a divine appointment and a divine contact, and that's the only way it's going to happen. You're going to encounter life that is an earth curse system that is dying all around you. And now the situation is, well, how are you going to respond when you face those things? I'm going to respond with thankfulness, not for that. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, be thankful, be thankful, be thankful in the midst of all things that you encounter. And everything you encounter, be thankful. Not for that, but the fact is, is your, your, your counter. As a matter of fact, can you put that scripture back up? Our very first one. I'd love to get that. In everything, give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So, during this Thanksgiving week, we're going to turn our hearts in, in the midst of everything to Thanksgiving. As a matter of fact, if you'll go into that situation that's uncomfortable with Thanksgiving, it'll surprise you how God will turn things right before your eyes. So are you facing challenges, difficulties, hurts, disappointments? I know, 
and I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. We're going to stand with you, and we're going to pray with you. You're going through it. I know you are, but I'm telling you, God's not through with you. God's taking you someplace. And in the midst of those things that you encounter, it's just something that is along the journey. But you're going on a journey. God's got things for you. You're not done. So the, get rid of the questions of why. Stop asking why. That's a, that's a trick question. Why? Get rid of that. What I want you to do today is now begin to say what. What's my assignment in the midst of this? That I want that? No. But what do you want me to do? How can I be a blessing? How can I turn the tables? How can I be a thermostat instead of a thermometer? <laughs> I, I was griping at Angie of something the other day. And all she said to me is, you're being a thermometer. <laughs> I knew exactly what she meant. Eventually I'll get around to apologizing, but not today. <laughs> Are you thankful? Can you just for just a moment before we pray, can you just close your eyes to me for just a moment? And can you think of something to be thankful for? Is there anything? Is there anything that you can reach for? Maybe somebody that helped you along the way, somebody who cared for you. Maybe somebody who was kind to you. Something that was given to you, maybe you didn't deserve, but they did it for you. Maybe it's just a kind word somebody gave. Can you just take just a moment? Just think about that for just a second. I'll wait. sing that song. I will sing. Love you, Lord. <laughs> oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God Okay, we're going to pray. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I guess I just got so caught up in life and the hustle and the bustle and the... I forgot to say thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the things that I said in response to someone, I was returning evil for evil. I'm sorry. I, 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 
I, I, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't want that to be a part of my life. Because I know that it's because of you that I live and I move and I have my being. I know that it's because of you. And I know you've always been faithful to me. You've always been so kind to me. I apologize, Lord, for complaining about my circumstances, my situations. And I want to turn to you, Lord, and say that I trust your goodness and your kindness, your generosity, and your perfect plan that is at work in my life, even when I can't see how that plan is going to work out. I know that you're, and I put my trust in you. Because <laughs> I know that the thing that you want from us most is the one thing that we have most difficulty giving, and that's our trust. Lord, I give you my trust. And I'm just asking, Lord, that you would receive me. <laughs> Cleanse me, Lord, from an evil heart of complaining or murmuring or finding fault or criticizing. I know that the Word of God has commanded me, don't say anything except it ministers grace to the hearer. Lord, I pray that that might be my path. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me that new, that new creation that you intended me to be. Lord, I'm asking in Jesus' name. Just before we're dismissed, is there anybody in this place that maybe you say, I don't have a relationship with the Lord. I'm not I've not given my heart to him. I think sometimes when I say I'm not saved, sometimes we don't even know what that means. But your heart's not right with God. You know it is or you know it isn't. It's that simple. And all the time, God's just saying to you, come to me, all you that labor and heavy load. Come on, come on, I'll give you rest. Is there anyone in this place that just says, my heart's not been right with God, and today I want to make my heart right with God. Maybe you've been away from God. Maybe, you, maybe you've never given your heart. You, you know where you stand. Is there anyone in this place? Is there anyone in this place? I just, I don't want, I don't want anyone to leave without us praying for you and ministering to you in that level. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Okay, is everybody happy? I'm going to ask all of our nurses to please line up along the back wall. And those of you that have been stepped on your toes, they're going to have toe ministry here today. <laughs> yes, would you, would you want to talk about it? Just real quick before we're dismissed, everyone, please stay and have lunch with us. Also, the pictures that we have are on the far side of the E.C. Smith building, so just, there'll, you can come anytime. Allison will be out there for a good bit of time to take your picture. Don't miss that opportunity. There's some really great family pictures there. Just, just get, get in line. I think you can figure it out. <laughs> well, I just want to be sure, all right? Okay, turn somebody, squeeze somebody, tell them, say, I love you.